What's up? It's your boy, it's your man, it's your dude, Harry Lately, uh, and welcome to the inaugural episode of Beyond the Pixels, um, where we like to talk to different artists, uh, influencers, uh, as well as advocates in the NFT space. So with that said, I'm super excited about the guest today, and if you don't know who this is, you're probably living under a fucking rock, or you're a hermit. Or you're a hermit crab living under a fucking rock. But either way, you should definitely know who the fuck this is. None other than Jason Bailey, a.k.a. Art Gnome. Yeah, thanks for having me on, Harry. And I have to say A-plus on that hat. I, uh, the more I look at it, the more... Jealous. That might be, that hat might be cool enough for me to give up the, the headband for a few days and, uh, and, and rock it. That's, that's cool. Thanks, man. Thanks, man. Um, so, yeah, you, um, you know... From my from my point of view, I've been one of the the biggest advocates um, and stewards within our space, and I say that wholeheartedly, just because you know, seeing you from afar, um, I've been, only been in the space maybe just over a year now, um, from like an NFT perspective, and ever since you know I joined Twitter, um, started to understand you know who the movers and shakers are within the space, um, I've always seen you you know, uh, approach things with a positive attitude, um, always been willing to help folks, always been willing to, to answer questions, always been, you know, um, advocating for, for smaller artists. Um, you know, you don't have an, an agenda. So just very much, um, a very much needed energy within the space. So I just want to say thank you, um, you know, starting off. Um, and that's, and that's, you know, <laughs> you know, one of the catalysts for me wanting to, you know, have this conversation with you just to dive deep. Um, again, more about who you are and then share that, you know, with, with folks in the space, because I know that if I'm wondering, um, you know, kind of the things that make you tick, I'm sure there's plenty of others out there, um, who feel in the same way. Yeah. Uh, super flattering. And I appreciate that, that intro, um, and the opportunity to, to be on, I think part of the reason I don't necessarily, um, have an agenda is, is has to do with when I first joined the NFT space. I think um, it wasn't particularly popular for the the multiple years that I was in, and it was kind of a nerdier thing that we were doing sort of altruistically. And I think when it blew up in 2021, the truth is, if I had started in this space in 2021, I don't think anyone would know who I am. I've never been good at being cool or doing the popular thing or like, you know, finding a way to like stand out like on the things that everybody else was trying to do, right? So I think a lot of the the folks that kind of became big stars in the space over the last year, um, or maybe I mean I don't I don't want to say this like blanketedly, but like are a little bit slicker than I am. I'm not particularly like a, a, a slick guy or whatever. I'm just a guy that like had a sincere and deep interest in art and tech for many many decades, um, and you know it kind of came in. Um, and early on, you know, late 2017, early 2018. And I think I benefited greatly from coming in and getting to meet a, a lot of other folks that had got here even before I did and just saw the vibe of the community and, and, you know, a really welcoming group of people that had a vision for building sort of a new art world, which, which really appealed to me. So, uh, and a lot, as with a lot of things in life, I think it was just luck and timing, um, you know, in terms of me being able to get in pretty early. Let's let's, you know, rewind the tape and, and go back to some of your early years. I know that, um, you know, you're on the East Coast, you know, for for folks like myself, um, I'm originally from San Francisco and like the stigma or uh, is like, oh, well, you know, when you think about artsy people, they come from either like a big city in New York, L.A. So tell me about like those early days in, in Massachusetts and maybe some of the, the things that inspired you, um, you know, about art. Yeah, I, so I come from kind of a weird family and and not a town you would think of necessarily for art. So my family um, are all engineers. My dad's an engineer. My older brother's an engineer. My younger brother's an engineer. Um, and both my parents, they got married really young. And like both my grandparents didn't really have a lot of money. So my parents like, you know, I think they were married at like 16 and 17, probably had me by the time they were like, you know, before they were 20 and they had already had my older brother too. And we were in a town that was very much like kind of like a, a blue collar town where most people are like plumbers or electricians and very much like a football town. So you look from the outside now as an adult, I look at that and I'm like, how the heck, you know, did I end up in art? But I was lucky um, in that, you know, my my dad's family uh, were military and were always traveling around and just loved museums and really valued 
um, art and drawing and painting, um, even though, you know, people often associate art as being something that's like uh, only for rich people or like, you know, only rich people can afford to collect art or it's like this thing that you have to like be a certain class. I actually grew up thinking that art was like consolation for poor people because we had like no money um, growing up. And the one thing we could do is get like library passes to like go to the museums. You get the free museum pass at the library. And my dad would take me almost like once a month to the Museum of Fine Arts and taught me history through the the museum right so you know i was super attracted to the art but i also learned about the world and learned about uh history and i had heard about sort of the the starving artist you know trope and like you know saw work by like van gogh and Millet and these people that sort of celebrated the workers so it wasn't until like much later on after i graduated uh, um, undergrad in art school actually that i realized that for a lot of people they associate art with like flexing and luxury and like rich people i always just thought like this is like what we poor people do or whatever, right? Um, so, uh, and then on my mom's side, you know, uh, she had seven or eight sisters and, and her parents really didn't have a lot of money either. And it's a, lot, it's a big family, but they made, uh, carved out, um, you know, money and time to take her to voice lessons. So she actually was like studying like opera. Um, and like, th this is in a town again, where, you know, she grew up in the same town that I grew up in where, um, you know, th there's not a lot of culture, uh, you know, art wasn't necessarily super uh, appreciated or valued, you know, the exception being um, my high school art teacher, who I owe a lot to as well, but kind of an unusual circumstance, to be honest, like, uh, not a town that you would expect um, uh, an art nerd like me to, to grow up in, uh, but it was really family uh, influence that I've, as I've gotten older, I've realized just how kind of rare and unique that was for the circumstances that I grew up in. So would you say that, um, you know, growing up where you did you feel like an outlier to some degree, considering that like the, the I guess the the common or average folks uh, that like of your age group weren't necessarily at the, the museums like you were? <clears throat> yeah, I'm a huge, uh, a huge nerd and always have been like I tried like all kids, like I tried to be cool for a little while and to fit in and to wear the right <laughs> clothes and like to do the right thing. But I had so many cards stacked against me. Uh, so I, I was also raised Mormon. And okay. uh, Mormons, there's like a lot of rules, right? Like a lot of things you can't do. So like yeah. I couldn't uh, watch, I could only watch like G-rated movies and like, you know, couldn't really listen to music that other people were listening to. So I got good at pretending like uh, th that I had seen movies I hadn't seen or like I knew music I didn't know <laughs> because like you're at school and people are like, oh, did you see this movie? And they're like quoting movies. And uh, I would just like memorize yeah. the, the quotes that other people had or whatever. But like, you know, we weren't allowed to go to dances and like all the things that everybody's kind of doing because Mormons are, are – I love Mormons. They're great. You know, I left the church a long time ago, but a lot of my, my yeah. cousins and relatives are still in it. They're good people, mm -hmm. but they're just kind of conservative, right? So I had yeah. that as like strike one. And then I've, you know, I'm sort of this art nerd with like deep interests and things that like normal little kids aren't into. Like when other kids wanted to be like, you know, I don't know, this is the 80s. So like, you know, Roger Clemens or like a baseball, you know, some like or a football player or whatever. I wanted to be like Jackson Pollock, uh, you know, like my heroes, even at a very young age, were like. 20th century painters and artists and things like that. So, and, and I'm a bit, honestly, I'm a bit of an introvert where I spent a lot of my time making art and reading and writing and those kind of things um, have always sort of appealed to me. So yeah, I was definitely um, uh, an outsider um, through all of high school and it wasn't really until I got to go to um, college and, and my major was art. And then I saw the other outsiders from all the other towns, you know, all came in and we kind of got to discover each other and realize that like, we weren't really outcasts. We just, this is before the internet. And like, you know, you thought maybe you were the only weird one that was in the art because you the only people you hung out with were the people in your town. So it wasn't yeah. until later until I kind of found my tribe. Which is, which is the case for a lot of us, like in terms of you, you go through that high school experience and you have like all the insecurities and all of the, like, you know, if you're trying to figure yourself out, and then, you know, if you're different, you know, you you kind of feel isolated and alone until you make it to, like you said, to a, a collegiate experience where you're able to kind of find, you know, like minded individuals, um, you know, and, and like you said, just kind of form your own tribe. But what's interesting, um, just going back to, like you said, in terms of going to college, were your parents um, were your parents supportive in that decision in terms of to pursue art in college? And the reason I'm asking is because. 
my parents were kind of the opposite. Um, like I originally wanted, so we have the, uh, the Academy of Art in San Francisco. Um, and I remember telling my dad like, Hey, I want to go to art school. And he's just like, you're not going to make any money doing that. So he actually like made me do something else with my life. Um, so at the time, I guess I wasn't as independently, you know, uh, wasn't as think thinking independently as I do today to where I was just like, okay, well, like I got to kind of do what my parents are, or want me to do and, and, and are guiding me towards. So, um, were, were your parents supportive in that decision? They were, but it was a mix in a way that made sense to me. Right. So, um, most of my aunts and uncles didn't get to go to college, uh, again, cause my parents didn't come from particularly wealthy families and my dad used college. He went to school nights. Um, it took him like 10 years. He graduated top of his class, but he was in school forever because he was working like two jobs and trying to take care of a family and got his engineering degree. And for him, uh, because he fought so hard to get through school and it took him so long and it was like because the the companies he worked for were willing to help out and stuff he did see college as a way to kind of give give yourself a better life right um it wasn't assumed um that you know a, a good life and the ability to take care of his family wasn't given to him it was fought for and it was and it was largely achieved by being able to to stick it out and have that college experience so on the one hand, you know, he was thinking of the utility of college, but on the other hand, he was really forward thinking and he thought, well, generationally, you know, my parents worked hard so that I could get the opportunity, you know, and, and I could eventually go to college where they didn't get to. I want my next generation not only to be able to go to college, but to be able to study something that they care about. Right. Um, so they mm -hmm. saw that um, as really uh, an important step. So. The, what he used to do, again, when I was in high school, um, this is sort of pre-internet or internet's really just starting. So my dad would cut out ads from the newspaper for graphic designers because he wanted to show me that like, hey, if you go into graphic design instead of say just like painting and sculpture and things like that, like there's a way to get like an actual job, you know, and a path towards a career. But ultimately, I think they saw like the only thing I cared about since I was a little kid was, you know, was fine art. And I was so deeply passionate about it that, you know, they were uh, they were nothing but supportive when I got there. Worried, worried for sure that when I graduated, like, is this kid going to be living at home forever? Or are we going to have to take yeah. care of him and stuff? So, you know, one thing, quick story that the, that I think he put in place to make sure like he wanted me to, to pursue what I wanted to pursue, but to make sure that I took it really seriously because I was kind of a bad high school student, uh, he put in a system. So he said like, if you get A's, any class you get an A for, I'll pay 100%. If you get a B, I'll pay 75%, uh, C, 50%, and anything under than that, like you're you're paying for it, you're right? <laughs> um, yeah, yeah, you're on your own. And he also made it clear that like, if I didn't get into college, I wasn't going to stay stick around the house. He's like, you know, you, if you don't get into college, you can join the military or find a job and move out, but you're not going to stick around here. And I, I needed that, you know, I mean, it, you know, I tell this story to other people and they're like, that seems harsh. Like you have this grading system or, but like, I absolutely needed that sort of the kick in the butt and the motivation. And I think that was his way of transferring over, like, you know, the struggles that he went through to try to like get ahead, you know, and to make sure that I didn't just go and goof off the whole time. Yeah, no, I mean, some people definitely need that, that, you know, um, I don't want to say like motivation, but, um, you, it's definitely a kick in the butt. Like, Hey, life is real. Like, and, and you need to be able to, cause they're not going to be here forever. So it's like, you, you need to be able to like, you know, navigate your life on your own and, and kind of take you know, accountability. So no, I, I definitely see how that was helpful for you. Um, so let's talk about, you know, you get to college um, you kind of find your tribe, like, what was that experience like, um, you know, being uh, an art major, right? Um, what, what, what was that like? Yeah, I went from almost dropping out of high school, uh, skipping a lot of my classes and like, you know, not really being a very good student at all to, uh, and many people, including my guidance counselor, thinking that there was no way I was going to get into college one of the few people my parents stuck by me and my high school art teacher really i owe everything to him uh, he passed away a couple of years ago uh, but was like when i was just not doing well on anything he was like you know you're uniquely talented um as an artist and he helped me build up my portfolio and it against like every to everybody's surprise like you know i got into college really largely based on my art portfolio i had had like my own art show by then it was doing like watercolor and oil paintings and things like that so but it was nothing anyone in high school cared about. When I got to college, 
I turned it around right away in the first semester. I went from being borderline high school dropout to getting um, a, a nearly full scholarship for, based on merit for my performance in my first semester at college. And that's because everything changed in high school. Like when I would like question the teachers and ask questions, because that's how I learn is like, you know, like I don't just sit and listen and take in information. I need to ask questions and like figure things out, you know? So when I would ask questions of the high school teachers, they would like tell me to shut up or that I was going to have to stay after class because they didn't like being challenged and they didn't want. So I brought that same behavior into college and they gave me a damn scholarship for it because they're like, here's somebody who's engaged and is thinking about these things. And like those college professors, they wanted to be challenged. They wanted to see that you're thinking about this and not just parroting back what they're telling you. Right. And then I was also kind of scared that I wouldn't be able to cut it, you know, because a lot of those classes that the other freshmen had like, you know, a strong background in math or in writing, you know, and I had goofed off in high school. So I knew I would have to work twice as hard as everyone else. But really, the biggest thing was about half my classes were art related, whether it was art history or studio art courses. And I was in just naturally wanted to be in the art studio all night, every night, like they had to like kick me out, you know, they, they changed the rules and we were allowed to stay in and work in the studios all night. And that's just all I ever wanted to do anyway. So it was really a good fit. And, you know, my classmates, um, you know, were a, a lot of them were just as excited to be able to kind of pursue what they had cared about full time. So we really encouraged each other um, and pushed each other that way. I mean, it was I, I don't want to exaggerate, but high school was pretty dark days. There were a lot of days where I'm like, you know, what's the point? Like if I do well in high school, I'm going to have to go to college. That just sounds like more school. And then I have to get a job. But all the adults around me hate jobs like, you know, so like like why am i even why do any of this right and then like i had that reprieve in college and it was like oh like life can actually be good i can have more control over my life and pursue things that i care about so yeah it was a real blessing so did you have that so you're in college um you know you navigate your way through that did you have um trouble kind of transitioning out of college like into the real world in terms of like using those skills that you that you you know obtained in college yeah can i swear on this podcast yeah yeah for sure just say what yeah, you want it, please it was it was scary as fuck <laughs> um so you know even before i went into art school adults were telling me like when you graduate you're going to be screwed because you're not going to be able to find a job right so i had had that weight on my shoulder all the way through college and i told myself I'm not going to listen. I'll figure it out when I get out or whatever. But then when I got out of um, you know, art school and graduated, I felt like all those adults that had been waiting to see me fail, right? They were like ready mm -hmm. for it. They're like, see, now you're going to fail because like you made that bad decision to go to yeah. art school or whatever. And I yeah. remember like right as I was about to graduate, other adults would like come to me and they'd be like, oh, well, like, what's your plan now that you're graduating? Like, what, you know, what are you going to do in the world or what are you going to do for a job? And it freaked me out for a few months. And then I learned if you just flip it back on them, none of them knew what they were going to do when they were my age, when I was like, just getting out. So I'd be like, did you know you were going to be like, you know, work as a secretary at a plumbing place or like, you know, do this, like whatever, this random like thing, you know, like no one ever yeah. knew that they were going to do it. And so when I asked them and I put it back on them, they're like, oh yeah, I had no idea. Like my uncle's brother, sister's cousin's neighbor, like gave me an opportunity and that's how I started yeah. this, you know? So yeah. then I, I started feeling a little bit better, but um, I graduated in 2001 um, and right. then went cross country with some friends. Cause I knew like, once I got on that, that wheel, the hamster wheel of working, like it might be decades before I could like take months off again. And unfortunately yeah. I started my job search on nine 11, uh, like the nine 11. So oh, like, wow. yeah. So the wow. night before my mom took me and my girlfriend at the time, who's now my wife of, um, uh, like 15 years together for 20 i think but married for 15 she took us out to like target to buy uh interview clothes right because we were both like getting ready to interview so that was 9 10 and then uh 9 11 was like when literally when i was going to start my job search and nobody was talking to anybody about because there was bigger things to deal with right no one yeah. was flying anywhere businesses were like freaked out the economy was like in a shambles and like so it was a, a really challenging time um but yeah, I and I was scared to death. I was back at home living with my parents briefly after graduating. And um, people were kind of saying like, see, you didn't have a plan and you went to school for art. So um, I, I basically went back into the family business. I went into to the engineering side, um, not as an engineer. Okay. Uh, I lucked out. 
a friend, you know, kind of basically nepotism, a friend of my dad's said like, hey, with 9-11, we need to be able to communicate to all of our, our clients and no one can fly anymore. And digital video had just come out. And they're like, you know, we, we'd like to hire your son as a technical reporter to go and talk to the engineers, which I was good at because my family were all engineers, and get updates from them and then edit the video. And like we can send the videos like physically back then because, you know, no one was like doing video online back then. Yeah. So I would make like DVDs with like, you know, HTML interfaces where you could click to get the interview. Um, but it was hilarious. You know, everybody needs someone to take a chance on them. That's why I try to help other people out that are younger. It was hilarious because like my role was technical reporter. I was neither technical nor a reporter. I had no idea how to, I had no idea how digital video worked. I didn't know how to use the camera. Shot yeah. some ugly, ugly footage, man. Um, and just tried to teach myself yeah. like editing and like Photoshop and Illustrator and all of that stuff. But yeah, that's I was just yeah. luck in in connections, honestly, that like helped me get my start uh, in the beginning. Dude, that's gotta be scary as fuck. Like to 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 come out of college like during 9-11 like i i similarly but not similarly like i i graduated um during the financial crisis so like trying to find a job like literally once like the market melted down it was just like bro like good luck like there's no way that you're gonna like so yeah i, I definitely was kind of floating around for a while and, and, and underemployed for a while after graduating college like what the hell did i just do with my life <laughs> Mm -hmm. so what did you go to, to school for? You were saying you wanted to go for art, but your dad said no. I ended up going for marketing. So, I mean, in a way, it's like loosely, you know, um, I, I'm still creative to some, you know, some degree um, where I get to select, you know, um, different things, uh, you know, select vendors that we hire or, you know, different creative folks. So I, I'm, I guess I'm able to get it out that way. Um, but definitely like in hindsight, especially now with like the emergence of NFTs with the emergence of just how, how art is embraced now within like in, in the commercial world. Um, I definitely see, you know, there was a lot more avenues that were going to be open to me if I did pursue art. But I mean, at the end of the day, you know, I'm able to, you know, take care of my family and things like that. So I'm not, I'm not too upset about it now. Um, because I, I'm able to get that creativity out in a different way, but Sometimes I think about it, like, what if I would have just, you know, stuck with it? But it is what it is. You can always go back at some point. I mean, we'll get to the later part of, of my journey, too. But um, I ended up basically doing marketing um, for 20 years. You know, I was that my titles were all, all became marketing. And I went back um, nights. I mean, this is how much I value art and art education. Uh, we mortgaged the, our house. Um, and my, you know, kudos to my wife to, to let me do this so that I could go back to school nights and get an MFA um, in digital art because like doing the day job and marketing, um, my soul was like kind of slowly dying, right? Because I knew what I wanted to do. I wanted to do something in art, right? And I just, I couldn't get there. But to your point, like it was, I got married young too. And it was like, you know, had to pay the mortgage and take care of the family and like, you know, um, but yeah, I guess to keep it more on the positive note, like it's never too late. You can always go back, you know, at some point. I know life has different stages where there are different other responsibilities you have to take on. But you're a young dude and uh, don't don't lose that dream. You know, there's always the opportunity further down the line. No, I appreciate it. Um, so we'll, we'll come back um, to your journey. But I guess because you, you brought up your wife a couple of times um, and I, I guess we'll, we'll pivot really quick because I, I think it's important for folks to know, like even like, again, from the outside looking in, like I see Aaron's post about, you know, not only like the work that you're doing, um, but also like being in supportive of like Club NFT and um, just I always see her, you know, engaged in, in things that you're doing. And I think just from hearing the last, like, like you said, from trying to get a job after college to mortgaging your house for, to pursue your dreams, like having that support system. Um, can you talk about like, you know, the, your relationship and how important that is for your success? Yeah. I, I mean, I'm super, super, super lucky. So, uh, Aaron and I met at Framingham state in undergrad and she was like, She's musically super talented. She was like the head of the theater group and she was she was in graphic arts. Like I wanted to be an art student, but went more into the 
a graphic art program. So like a triple threat, still super, uh, super creative. She had initially wanted to go to uh, Brown where she was accepted and study theater. Uh, but um, her family, like my family, weren't particularly well off um, and, you know, thought a state school um, would, be, you know, would be more affordable or a better route to go. So uh, we had sort of similar backgrounds and met there. And uh, she, you know, we, we both kind of were aware of each other, uh, but, you know, uh, she had a little bit of a crush on me. So she got a job at Starbucks uh, where I was working to put, you know, help put myself through school or whatever. And uh, it eventually, I was kind of a dumb dude, but it eventually caught on that, like this cute girl <laughs> that had a crush on me or whatever. Uh, and, and we went cross country together after we graduated uh, with a bunch of friends, but eventually it was down to the two of us. And that's when we like really kind of bonded. Um, and when I came back, I didn't realize it, but she was mad at me, uh, because I kept traveling and, you know, and like, you know, it wasn't really clear what the relationship was like or whatever, but yeah. we pretty quickly, you know, became like serious boyfriend and girlfriend and went through a lot of these struggles trying to find, you know, work together at a time when people thought, you know, what are these two goofballs going to do? And nine 11 is going on and we were kind of there for each other through it got a small, uh, tiny condo in kind of a sketchy town, part of town, and kind of lived there for a while and went through that period uh, together, kind of supporting each other. Um, again, that's a, a tough time coming out of college. It's sort of a tough time. Like, how am I going to be an adult? And we kind of helped each other through that, got engaged. I never thought I was going to get married because I thought I'd be like a poor artist my whole life or whatever. Yeah. But this super cool dude that I worked with, uh, who's like a PhD in physics, but like a real funky dude that was like into jazz and stuff that we would like go out for drinks with sometimes he pulled me aside and he's like dude when are you going to propose to her she's like the most creative amazing woman in the world like you know and you are kind of a dork <laughs> you know and she's like he's like basically like you're punching above your weight there you know buddy you should lock it down so um yeah you know i proposed and um you know, she really has put my, my career and my interests um, and my goals uh, ahead of hers for the last uh, 20 years. And it's just been super supportive. You know, I mean, I think I it's easy to take it for granted, but our relationship is really strong. So I've never had to even wonder what it's like to be lonely. Right. I've known that I've got someone by my side that uh, I never question like her love or support. I've never worried about like you know, her leaving me or cheating or be interested. So it's just like, it's never, I've never even had to deal with those thoughts of like, what's it like as an adult to feel like you're by yourself and don't have someone supporting you. Cause she's yeah. like been there the entire time, you know? So yeah, I think anything that I've done that, um, that is, is a positive thing is because she's been there to, to take a shoulder, a lot of the load um, in terms of like stuff around the house and like so supporting me when I'm frustrated or confused or angry or pain in the ass to deal with, and uh, we yeah. really are sort of a, a partners, you know. Yeah, man, that's what it's all about. Like that, that, that partnership. That's that's the key word right there because it's it's a symbiotic relationship in the sense like there's things that you bring to the table, there's things that she brings to the table, and then that that kind of that it all kind of comes together. Um, but like you said, like having someone to lean on is is super important. Um, not only like you said in in time, trying to find a job, but then also supporting your passions and and as you navigate life and things like that. So that was one of the things I definitely wanted to, to, you know, pick your brain about, because I think it's important. There's a lot of folks um, who don't have that same, you know, level of support who, um, that I see in the space that are like, hey, my wife thinks I'm fucking crazy. Like, you know what I mean? <laughs> like but with you guys, it's just like, it's like you guys, it's like, um, yeah, I always see just, just positivity um, coming from you guys. And it is definitely, um, you know, good to, good to see for sure. Um, I think she likes now, the crazy, the craziness. I think honestly, like she <laughs> would, like if I was too tame and I wasn't taking enough risk, you know, I would yeah. almost have the push from the, from the other side. Yeah. So you, so going back to like the, the career journey, you, you are, you know, doing these uh, technical recordings, then you're in marketing. Um, were you able to, to come back to art full time or were you still, I guess to this day navigate. I mean, now you've got your own projects going on, but um, can you can you speak about like the transition where you finally got back to doing some things that you love? Yeah, it was pain a painful process, and I I had to learn along the way. I think ultimately what I've decided, and I'll go back to sort of the story of it, but ultimately what I've decided is like 
doing something that's art like but not on my terms is almost worse than just not doing anything art related at all right so after that first job i spent five years as a an accident reconstruction animator right so wow. uh like if uh there were major car accidents or building explosions like big stuff that you would see on the news they would yeah. pay um experts from like mit and harvard because i'm in that massachusetts area that would go and like do the analysis to figure out what went wrong and defend, you know, either the the victim or the company or whatever. And uh, it's almost always with big cases because they could afford to pay me to go and do all the measurements and figure out like, you know, where the markings on the road were and what kind of car it was. And then we would create 3D models and recreate the accident based on the data that the, the technical folks had gathered. Right. So, again, sort of this background where I'm used to being around engineers and scientific people, even though I'm not an engineer or scientific myself, and I would use my art skill to help tell the story visually. Right. So but some crazy things like I made animations of like the largest wartime explosion in Europe um, or non war wartime explosion in Europe, this uh, thing called the, the Bunsfield oil explosion or whatever. Um, wow. And like, you know, failed amusement park rides and like all these like, you know, but even that eventually got to me because like I was basically dealing with like tragedy, illustrating tragedy, like nonstop in this sort of non-emotional way. Actually, to be in a, in a courtroom, uh, a lot of people don't know this, but the exhibits, whether it's an animation or a static 2D uh, exhibit, they can't be seen as uh, biased or showing any emotion. So my job was literally to make art that had absolutely zero emotion <laughs> for, for five, to talk about hell for like five years of people getting injured. Right. And I'm like, you know, like, you know, it, I used it as an opportunity to go to RISD nights and learn how to do like 3D animation and Maya and build my skills. But it, it would be like if um, if you were like a, a saxophone player or whatever, and like all you wanted to do was be a musician and there you got a job and they're like, all right, you can play your saxophone, but you just have to play this one note and like, you know, and that's it, you know, and, and make sure you put no emotion, <laughs> in it, you know. Right. So. Right. So, yeah. And, and the story kind of keeps going. I, I eventually I left that place um, and started my journey into sort of software companies where I worked for most of my career was in marketing and in software companies. And uh, the, the funny story was I was sort of an illustrator by that time because I had done like illustration and used my art skills to get to illustration. And people yeah. kept coming down at the hall in like suits that like would tell me to change things. They're like, oh, make that purple or move this over here or do this. And I'm like, and the advice was like almost always bad, right? And, yeah. and they, cl they clearly made more money than I did. And I'm like, I couldn't tell what they did like work-wise. I'm like, who are these guys and girls that are making all this money? They dress nice, so they must be like doing pretty well. And they don't seem to have any skill. And they're just, and, and, and I, I don't want to give you shade because I know you're a fellow marketer, but someone's like, oh, that's marketing. And I'm like, that's what I want to do. <laughs> I, I don't want to be the guy who gets told like what I have to do and to change this yeah. and move it around and illustration and make less money. I want to yeah. be the guy who gets to come down and say like, change this or make this or do that. You know, so I basically swapped over, um, into marketing, but learned marketing from an engineer. Again, I was always in technical companies and uh, I was at a company where they had just fired all the marketers because they couldn't explain where the money was being spent. And they took an engineer and moved him in charge of marketing. And this is like yeah. right around the time the web and web advertising started getting really popular and everything was about measurement. So how can you measure that the marketing spend is actually, which it was actually a nice shift at that point in time. I was so tired of, of, illustration which was subjective and being told that people didn't like something and they didn't have to have a reason just the, you yeah. know makes the, make this purple because my wife's favorite color is purple and i'm your boss yeah. or whatever right yeah. and then in marketing if someone was like i don't like your campaign i'm like well my campaign blew the doors off of your campaign and we're bringing in like twice as many users at half the cost and here's the data to prove it that was yeah. kind of a nice shift for a bit you know yeah no, I mean, we, it's funny that you mentioned that because I've been through a similar experience in terms of uh, them literally canning the, the entire department for, for overspending um, and not having, you know, anything to show for it and then bringing in a new regime of, of leadership and things like that. So, it, yeah, it's funny that you mentioned that, but it does happen, folks. It, it does happen out there if you're watching this. Um, so, so now that, I mean did you eventually transition? Like, are you in marketing still? Or are you hundred percent full time on your own independent project? Yeah. So how, how the rest of that story sort of goes is, um, 
you know, I was making good money then, which was important. It wasn't, um, it wasn't clear that I was going to be able to like pay the rent or the mortgage and take care of my family. By then I had done pretty well, established myself as a guy in marketing, but my, on the inside, I was kind of dying because all I wanted to do was art. And that, that was, let's call that 2007 to 2010. Um, I won't get into the whole story, but I had a health issue. Yeah. I, I got Lyme really bad and ended up in the ICU for three weeks with like a temporary pacemaker and like, oh, damn. like, That'll like almost dying will like give you some clarity real quick, right? Um, About what's remember, it really important and how to spend your time and, and that type of shit. Yeah, you nailed it. So I remember my mom sitting at the bedside, um, like on like the second week of being hooked up to a pacer wire wire in the ICU, and she was like, you know, well, what would what do you want to? What is it you you know you wish you would have done or that you want to do if and when you get out of here and things get back to normal? And I said, I always wanted to go back to school and get my MFA. Like I always, that's just, it's what I wanted to do. So when I left the hospital and got out, I quit um, the, the job I had at the time and thinking that I would go to school um, days and just take on a whole bunch of loans. And it ended up, I got another job and worked my way through and swapped to, to night school. But that's where I learned about digital art. I mean, I had been doing these things like during the day, like, learn, you know, making 3D animations and like teaching myself some like flash animation. But for three years, night school, Massachusetts College of Art and Design and a program called Dynamic Media, which was way ahead of its time. I was learning about, um, you know, how to make generative art and code and digital art history and like digital art history, like in in depth, um, you know, from 2007 to 2010. And again, just like in, in uh, college, all of a sudden I was happy again. Right. Like this is my way to like, you know, I knew I was doing what I should be doing. Right. And uh, when I got out of that, I went back to focusing on my career for a while. But that that bug, you know, the itch, you know, of like, this isn't I need to be doing more art stuff hit. And that's when I started artgnome.com uh, maybe six, seven years ago. Um, and it was around gathering data about art history, which I'm just as passionate about as, as art making and using sort of data as a lens to fight forgery and to look at art history in a different way. And that got me invitations to because people were like, oh, crap. This guy has more data about like the art market and art art history than like anybody. Like that could be really powerful, almost like Moneyball with sports, right? So I started getting invitations to like Sotheby's and Christie's events where they wanted to know like, you know, what are you doing with this data or like what are your plans or you know, and and I picked up on the fact that like this is again six, seven years ago. I was like really high on digital artists being like the most important artists of our generation. But I would go to these events and I'm like, how come no one in the art world it's really treating digital artists as like serious artists, right? Like here I'm thinking they're like the most important artists of our generation. And they're kind of like, well, computers don't make real art and this, that, and yet like just kind of outdated, you know, outdated thinking. So I swapped to using Art Gnome as a platform really to elevate and tell stories about the amazing things people were doing with like AI and ML. Like this is six, seven years ago, not just for making art, but definitely for making art, but also for like, you know, um, image recognition for sorting, you know, archives of art history and like, you know, nerdy stuff. But it turns out like there's a lot of people in the world that are either from the tech side that care about art and we're like hungry for like a way for those th two things to intersect or from the art side, but kind of interested in, in tech, you know, and I was filling this gap, you know, I mean, it was nerdy, but I was filling a gap where there wasn't a lot of people writing about that topic in a really down to earth, approachable, passionate kind of way. Um, so that, that again, I don't want to give the, um, the illusion that I got to do any of this during the day. I'm working my ass off, like, you know, in jobs during the day and I'm waking up at four in the morning so that I can do some writing and then at nights and weekends, like these are all passion projects, right. That, that I was doing. Um, and I would say all the way up to when, um, I mean, we can go back to when NFTs start and when I get into that, but when 2021 hits, I had, I had decided that I wanted to consult on my own, I guess in 2019, I kind of took that leap and left the company and became like a marketing and business consultant on my own. By then I had enough connections that I could do that. And that was sort of the first leap, but again, not art. I'm like working my ass off, you know, as a consultant and doing, you know, art gnome nights and weekends and the NFT stuff nights and weekends. Um, and it's not until 2021 when everybody's like sees the NFT explosion, uh, investors started coming to me and saying like, Hey, you've been in this space for a while. We kind of laughed at you when you were spending money on JPEGs. Everybody could see for free. 
but now it's exploding and we get it now. Like, you know, would you take you're a startup guy, you've been in startups for 20 years. Would you take some money and, and do like a marketplace or like a, an art fund? And uh, I was like, we don't need another marketplace. Like my friends started the first marketplaces. They're doing great. I don't want to compete with them. They're still doing great. Like, you know, I got nothing to add there and collecting arts, my passion. If I had to do that to like turn a profit for you, it would kill it. It's like, that's not, not what I want to do either. So I kind of came back to them um, and said, look, the biggest problem in the space is that nobody realizes all these NFTs are going to break. It's nuts. Like we're, we're heading in from like low millions to tens of billions of dollars being spent on NFTs. We already know that I know they're going to break. It's not if like they are. It's just a matter of when. And no one's really putting in the tools for collectors to be able to protect themselves and back their stuff up. So, yeah, I know I kind of jumped forward a bit there, but like that's kind of how I got to to finally, you know, at 40, 42 years old, 43 years old, finally got to where my job is mostly about art. But even then, I'm not making art. I'm celebrating other people's art and I'm helping people protect art. And, uh, you know, the goal is that when I retire and I'm, you know, we, we live pretty humbly, my goal is to retire early and just make art, like finally get to that spot. You know, you, like you were saying, you want to get to a spot where, you know, like maybe you could go back and, and go to art school. For me, it's like, I want to get to a point where like, I can just live humbly and just spend my hours like, like making art. Cause I've been chasing it my whole life, you know? Yeah, no, but it's 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 a pretty compelling story, man. Like even to get to the place that you are now to where you're able to parlay like the skills that you've you and experiences that you've encountered like over this time to now to do something like even though, like you said, you're not making art on a, on a full time basis during the day, but you're doing something that is I mean, you're helping other people. Um, and then obviously you get to then talk to artists, you get to talk to collectors, you're still within that ecosystem of, you know, the art world, which is, which is amazing, which is a, 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 an amazing story. Um, we'll get into, um, you know, what you're doing with club NFT, but can you speak about, um, just the, the space in general? I mean, cause obviously you said, you know, in school, you're doing all this generative art and around like 2007 to 2010, um, like you said, like way ahead of way ahead of its time considering the fact of like how prevalent you know all that stuff is today um can you speak about like the the state of the union right now with with the nft space um uh, i won't get into like why i mean we, we it's pretty clear why you're in the space um but just just to uh it, it would be good to uh, to understand like your perspective because there's there's obviously the side where there's like collectors who love the art but then there's also it seems right now the 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 bulk of the participation is is folks who are trying to make money. So as somebody who has come from the traditional art world who has an appreciation for, um, you know, the work, the artist, the history, all the things that go into it, like you know, you can tell that your your heart and soul is in it versus just trying to make a quick buck. Can you tell me like how do you reconcile, um, you know, the the two with, considering your background? Yeah, I'll, I'll, let me do a quick journey from 2017 till now, because I think that'll tell the story of how, why I feel the way I feel about where we are um, today, right? So, I mean, I, I get into NFTs 2017 really because someone points me to blockchain and we're not, NFTs, we're not really calling them NFTs. There's like crypto kitties out there, uh, crypto punks, some early experiments like Dada, NYC, the rare Pepe's, right, have been kicking around for a couple of years then. And uh, but it's early. I mean, it's real. No one's buying much of anything. Right. And and I wrote this article where I just saw that this was going to be the future. I'm like, you know, everybody's moving towards collecting digital things like, you know, I, I worked at a video store when I was younger. And by then, like everybody's just Netflix. There is no physical component to your video. Right. Like music. There is no more CDs or whatever. You're just it's streaming. Right. So it was so clear to me that like, you know, ownership was just moving towards the digital um, and that the old art world system was kind of broken, right? There's a very small number of wealthy people supporting a very small number of artists. And like having been in art school twice and knowing thousands of artists and knowing none of them, not one, not a single artist was making a living off of it. I was like, that's a broke ass system. We should uprise and just start from scratch. The worst thing that we can do is replicate the bad system that's already in place or create a new bad system. But there's a chance we can do something better or create something new. And I found like-minded people in 2017, 2018, you know, with like Bea and Judy from Dada and these people that were like, 
None of those people were in it for money because there wasn't any money and there was no reason to believe there was going to be any money. The only people that were attracted to the space back then were there because we thought we could build a better system. And there were a lot of people coming from crypto that had sort of decentralization values. And like, you know, there was a goal to build sort of a, a global system where there were no barriers and anyone could participate and no middlemen. Right. And it was really a beautiful, beautiful thing. So I think when people hear that I got in early, if they came in last year, sometimes they're like, you've been doing, you've been riding this, you know, wild bull for like four or five years. It's like, no, nah. it was a few dozen people and none of us were in it for money. It was like a bunch of experimental hippies trying to like figure out how to use tech to make a better art world. And it sounds like, not to cut you off, but it sounds like it, what, it had nothing to do with crypto. Like crypto just ended up being the vehicle for the digital art collection but if it was something else you would have been on that too like it had nothing to do with crypto really for me for sure but for some of the other folks i think crypto really was really central it was this idea like a power to the people like they had just used crypto crypto to sidestep banking and that gave them this power that maybe we can use crypto and blockchain to sidestep this big, powerful art world and like kind of build our own decentralized art world. We had some what I now think are maybe backwards ideas back then about how we could get rid of curation and like get rid of galleries. And like, you know, it turns out if you were like making physical art, and no one was buying it, turning it into an NFT doesn't magically make collectors come running. We still need those people, <laughs> right? You still need shout out yeah. to the, the curators and to the, yeah. the galleries and like, you know, the marketplaces and the people that, so we learned that lesson kind of hard, right? That like, you know, you, you need people to help give context there, but artists did end up with more agency and kind of power over their careers as a result. But yeah, there was a glimmer in 2018 of like, maybe there's a way to make money here, but for like a month and then it was just like, boop, like, you know, like the, the question, you know, by 2019, there was at Rare AF2, where like, again, the small community of nerds that were still into this stuff, even though the market had crashed, we were all asking each other, like, is this thing kind of done? Like, you know, is anyone this time next year, is anyone going to care? You know, because no one really seen it seemed like it wasn't just not like no longer cool. It was uncool. Like, you know, there was during that um, the ICO period when like, you know, people are like, oh, it's a bunch of scammers and like, it's not cool or whatever. So again, the only, and I'm still writing and collecting, you know, in 2019 and 2020, because for me, it was about a cool way, a cool mechanism to support creatives all around the world. That's all, all it's always been, right? And that was still there. I could still do that, you know, even in those down down periods, right? So to 2021, to, to get all the way up today a little bit faster, uh, the the Beeple sales, the big transition, right? The Beeple, like we we did see collecting start to pick up before Beeple, and we were getting a pretty vital. There were early whales that were like, you know, we were getting a pretty vital community, and then the Beeple sale hits, and people, the whole world starts to pay attention because people, even if they don't care about art, they see a big amount of money spent on something like that, and they care. They like start to pay attention, right? It's just gossip and. That's when I started to hear about it. like all everybody's texting me and it's like, dude, like some some guy bought a a digital piece of art for like seventy million dollars. Like, wait, what? Like, it, it, yeah, it got my attention. So I, I yeah, I I, I, was, I would have to agree that that was the the catalyst for me for sure. Yeah, and it was. It, I always say it's a double edged sword. So I met people a couple of times. Super nice guy. And even before I met him, I said, "Look, anybody that he, I know, he did work every day. Anybody that does that as an artist, like, gets my gets my respect." So separate from who he is as a person, if we look at that event, we had spent three years as a bunch of like you know altruistic hippies trying to find a way to build a new art world that was not about money. That could be a way to like bring in people that like from all around the world and a, a way to support them through sort of fractional or minimal payments but from lots of different people like we had this whole model planned out where it would stay focused on art but we might be able to help out a little bit and, and recognize it. and all of a sudden in comes this huge sale from the right side like and like everyone starts paying attention and all these people that thought had no interest in what i was doing they started coming to me and they're like so this is what you've been doing for four years like you know because like you know like this doesn't look like you know anything you'd be into they're like you know this is like we got a, a white guy um, selling a single work of art for $70 million through a 200 year old auction house. That doesn't sound that innovative to us. Like, you know, why are you like pouring your soul into this? And I'm like, that's not what we were about. And like, I appreciate that. Like, you know, the only reason the news is talking about it and it's starting to scale up is because of, the, of that sale. 
but it literally almost couldn't be more the opposite of the values and the principles that we were trying to, to spread, right? And then it kind of just caught fire and we realized we weren't going to have like any control and very limited influence over the direction that things were going to go in 2021 when you would see like most influential NFT people, like, it would be like, you know, Paris Hilton and Kanye or whatever, <laughs> like, you know, and meanwhile, we're like, like we basically helped to invent this stuff or like popularize it or whatever, but like, it just, it got that big and it need like all technologies to become really mainstream and relevant. They need to go through that, that period, right. Where they get big like that. And I'm not going to lie. I did really well. Look, I owned a bunch of the early stuff that people decided that they wanted. And like, I made life changing money, even though I've never proactively gone out and tried to like find buyers, people came because I was an early collector and like, you know, it, it changed our flexibility and what we can do. And, you know, I talk about wanting to make art later in life and, Part of why I think I might be able to do that is because we had some good sales as the world got really excited about this space. And I know a lot of my art friends did pretty well, too. But by the end of 2021, it felt kind of gross. And most of us were really tired. It was just like a manic year of like, you know, the artists couldn't make work fast enough because people were buying it before it was even made. And like art needs time. Like, you know, it's just like people need time to be thoughtful. And um, it was just like the crank was turning, I think, too fast. So I was kind of wishing and hoping even though i own all these nfts i was like wishing and hoping for a collapse by by 2022 i mean i started a company you would think like well you must want nfts to keep going up and up and up forever but like it just wasn't healthy it grew too big too fast and like this year to, to finally get my long-winded answer around to your real question like where we are now is the best space i've ever seen it we have this balance of like a broad group of people that are interested for a while, the traditional art world was kind of hating on NFTs last year, and they've come around to where like they're supportive and they're seeing this as an opportunity to really educate and bring in a whole bunch of new people that care about art that maybe never did before, right? Artists are able to slow down and actually make you know work a little bit more thoughtfully and not like under pressure to like you know capitalize on sort of this crazy moment where like so much money can be made. The people that were only here for money that like literally would just would have gone if it was dog food taking off, whatever the hell it was, they would have chased it. They've moved on because they're like, oh, like I can't there's no get rich quick scheme here anymore or whatever. So like we've got this great balance of like people knowing about what, you know, NFTs are and about the space and the potential, but really only like builders and artists and real collectors who are collecting because they like art. Like, you know, it's really consolidating around people that have, I think, um, you know, longer term goals that are really better for everybody. So I'm really happy with where we are, actually, which is weird because we're in the middle of a, a, a bear market, right? No, I mean, you, you bring up a good point, though. It, it For the folks who are still in it, you know, besides the, the bag holders from last year, um, they're the folks who are actually genuinely like um, genuine participants in the space. Like you said, like all of the, the, the get rich quick folks are kind of faded and you can see that by the 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 user like the sales like the number of transactions all of that stuff is like kind of dwindled down or, or actually not just dwindled like it's it's dropped quite dramatically you know what i mean and those folks are kind of out of it um i mean i definitely foresee there there probably be a, a, another you know more ebbs and flows as um you know over the years but like you said hopefully like the the core uh group is just like genuine collectors um how do you how do you foresee um, the space continuing do you or or what will be the mechanism for the space to continue growing but from an organic like perspective not with these like just parabolic jumps of like people trying to make money then it busts these boom and bust cycles um like you've seen uh previously yeah you nailed it my hope you used the word organic my hope is that we see sort of an organic growth like moving forward right so like a lot of people compare it to the uh, the dot com boom and bus cycle so when you know the internet first took off and everybody saw opportunity it just got way too hot grew way too fast and then it popped and people thought well the internet's dead now no one's ever going to use that right but like obviously slowly it grew and it grew and it grew that's what i'm hoping for but like there's another part of my brain that's like well Crypto is inherently volatile, right? And and I don't care what anybody says. I think the success and failure of NFTs are tied to the crypto markets because 90% of these uh, NFT markets require, um, uh, you know, like a MetaMask wallet or some kind of cryptocurrency, right? Um, you know, there are a few that take credit cards or whatever, but like most of it 
it's like crypto literate people who are in, inherently invested at, at least a little bit in order to buy these things into crypto. And when crypto crashes, they're hurting and have less money to spend. And when crypto goes way, 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 way up, there's only so many things you can spend your crypto on, right? So like, I'm I'm hoping for an, an organic increase, um, you know, rather than like boom bust. But like, and I'm not an economist, but I've already been on the record for saying like, I think we're in for some tough times. You know, I, I because I'm a CEO of a company, a big part of my job is trying to figure out what the economy looks like and how much we have to raise and where things are going to go. And most of the people that I know that are really smart, that are under pressure to make predictions so that their companies can survive, um, have sort of pointed to, uh, you know, by mid next year, we're going to see a pretty nasty global recession. And, you know, there could be some downtimes for, I'm guessing, one or two years. Um, I wish I could say that crypto was like a great hedge for like, you know, the regular economy going down. But I haven't seen that in my short time in crypto. Like when the pandemic hit and the stock market went down, crypto went down right along with it. Right. Um, so I, I, you know, the good news is we've got all if you're in this space, we have all these creative friends all around the world. Right. And like we can still have fun and make awesome projects and support each other, um, even when there's a bad economy and things are kind of crashed or whatever. And the work we do now, I think, will be the work that's used to smooth things out so that when crypto does come back up and the economy does come back up. We're not quite as crazy as we were last year, and maybe we don't forget all the values, and maybe we've built in some of the processes and the infrastructure that's needed for this stuff to scale and to help people onboard a little bit better, you know. So uh, you can probably sense it in my voice. I'm a little trepidatious. I'm just hoping that we like. I'm hoping we can grow organically, and I'm hoping we learn some lessons. But you know, it, it does seem to be the nature, the boom bust cycles of of crypto um, that it's kind of swings wildly. Yeah, I mean, I, I mean, I personally think, um, I mean, it's gonna take some time for sure. But I, I think, I, I definitely think crypto is here to stay, just as we transition away from fiat currency to to central bank digital currencies. Like that's inevitable. Um, as you can see, like the the emergence of the metaverse and like Meta or formerly Facebook now making all of these you know part uh, partnership announcements with Microsoft yesterday and. And they're doing a number of things. So when you look at all of these things separately, they may not make sense. But if you look at the landscape together, you can see kind of the pieces building. And then once we have regulation, I, I, I predict a consolidation in the crypto market where, you know, folks kind of, um, like you said, see crypto as this like, oh, stick it to the man. And, and, and we're going to, you know, step around the banks. It's like, I think, you know, for, for a large part, for, people might not want to hear this. I, I, they're. I think they're in bed together in some degrees, you know, and regulation is going to to kind of identify the ones who like are in bed with the IMF. And we're going to have, you know, the the short list of of those. Um, so not to not to shit on crypto or anything like that, but I, I definitely see that it's going to be here to stay because of the fact of it allows them to kind of finance, you know, their their own like government debt in, in, in new ways. So, um but ultimately, to say all that, like I, I definitely foresee, you know, NFTs are going to be here for some time. Uh, all, all this digital art, these digital collectibles, et cetera, is going to be here for some time. But I think, to your point, it's going to be, it's going to be painful to get to that point. Um, we're going to go through some, some hurt for sure, um, like economically. But not to end on a doom and gloom perspective. But um, can you tell? F <laughs> but can you tell folks that are not familiar? Um, I do want to make sure that you. Um, talk about, you know, Club NFT, because I do think regardless of what, you know, the economy is go going through, um, like you said, in terms of all of these NFTs breaking and things like that, people do need to protect their collections. Um, and, and for those are who aren't familiar, can you, you explain Club NFT and, and, and what your core value proposition is? Sure. And, and just an attempt to make it less doomsday, because I agree with everything that you said. The thing to remember, like the same way the early days of the Internet were like the Wild West and super creative. And then it got regulated down to where everybody just used Facebook like half the time as their primary well, or like Google. It's like three companies or whatever. I agree with you that that kind of consolidation is going to happen. But rather than be sad about that, embrace today, embrace this year. Right. Like this is this is the creative time in crypto when things aren't regulated like fully yet. And like people don't really understand all the use cases yet. Like this is the time to like, you know. The, the cake, I like to say the cake hasn't been baked yet, right? We get to decide kind of what directions things are going. So like, 
yes, I, I actually think we're going to have the same outcome you described, unfortunately, but like all the more reason to embrace this period of time, you know, uh, on that front. So yeah, on the, uh, the club NFT side, you know, it's basically, I, I started collecting before a lot of people, like in the late 2017, early 2018. And I flew around the world with like Matt and John from CryptoPunks and Bea and Judy, because there's like a dozen of us that kind of like gave these presentations. And I would say, well, the amazing thing, we weren't even calling them NFTs, but like the amazing thing about art on the blockchain um, is that you don't have to depend on anyone. It's just like crypto. Like, you know, if the marketplace goes out of business, like you own your NFT and no one can mess with you. So like, that's like, what an amazing way to like show. And you can also show there's only so many of them, which is great, right? So it brings scarcity and like there are all these properties that are great. And, uh, but then 2018, like as the year went on, we saw additional and a scribe and digital objects and rare art all go out of business. And at the time, that's like almost more than half of the marketplaces that are out there. And with as each one went out of business, we realized like, oh, crap, like either I can't access my NFT anymore or I'm not sure the token was ever making or was ever made or, oh, crap, like this this marketplace was actually custodying the NFT and I never even made it into my wallet or the one that that we're trying to solve, which is oh wait the art was never on the blockchain like the token the tokens on the blockchain right but the token is pointing to the art and the metadata and it turns out a lot of times that art and that metadata were living on just a private server owned by that company right so you get emotionally involved and i'm telling everybody all around the world look at me i own this art no one can take it away from me or whatever then the company goes under they turn off the server now i have a token on the blockchain that points to nothing right? it points to a broken image so um, you know, fool me once, shame on me, you know, it's basically like, you know, I, I had that happen to me once. And then when the, the NFT explosion happened, I'm like, well, someone must have like solved this because you can't spend tens of billions of dollars, you know, in a space to only have a, like more than half of these things disappear. Right. But no one was like, no one was trying to solve it. So I'm like, okay, like that's, that's enough of a motivator that like, you know, I, I'm willing to start a company around that and, you know, met with my technical co-founder, Chris, who I think you know, I think you've uh, interviewed uh, before as well. And I said, look, this is a, a huge problem. People still don't really pay attention to it. It's crazy. Like the analogy I would use would be like if everyone just bought cars last year for the first time, like no one had cars before and everyone bought cars and everyone had promised them, look, the cool thing about cars is they never break. They're never going to fail. Like you don't have to do nothing. And then like a year or two later, you know, they're going to start falling apart. Right. And there's this massive opportunity because there aren't any like now we have mechanics on every street of every town all around the world because cars fall apart. Right. And people need to you don't have to do all the maintenance yourself, but you need to somebody has to take care of these things or tell you how to back them up and maintain them. Right. So we kind of see ourselves as sort of like the, the mechanics in a space where we're giving this free offering. You don't have to know how to download and back up all your off chain assets. But you should at least know less than 10% of NFTs um, actually store everything on the, on the chain. Like, so that's 90% are off chain, uh, the core assets. And of those 90%, 40% are just on some dude's server at a startup. And we know like nine out of 10 startups fail, like within 10 years. So like, this isn't like Jason's crazy sky is falling. Like this is going to happen. If you spent money and you're emotionally invested in your NFTs, like, Go back them up, right? Um, unfortunately, for those private servers, there's nothing we can help you with there because, like, it's too late. That's they're dependent on a private server. If they're on IPFS, which is nerdy, and I won't go into the whole thing, but the beauty of IPFS is those assets when they made the NFTs, there's a cryptographic code tied to the the token. And as long as you have a copy of those assets, you can always restore them. So if, if people stop paying to pin them right now, you're probably dependent on a marketplace paying. Like I ask people, I'm like, you think storage is free or like, who do you think is storing these, these assets that you quote unquote own? If you're not paying to pin them and you don't have a copy, you know, locally, then your NFTs are pretty much screwed. Not only the ones that are on private servers, but the ones that are using IPFS. And I hate being like the, the Grim Reaper. Like I clear, no one loves collecting NFTs more than me, but like you got to be responsible. You have to be kind of crazy just to assume you're going to spend thousands, tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands, millions of dollars on these things and never ask like, what's the shelf life? What are the components? How do they fall apart? What do I have to do to be a steward and sort of take care of them? So not to freak everybody out, you know, and not to get super nerdy. The solution is pretty easy. Go add, put your wallet in. You don't even have to connect your wallet. Just put your public wallet address in, 
click a button. I'm sure you've used it, Harry. Click a button. It goes through. It backs up all your NFTs, all the off-chain assets. We give it to you in a zip file. There's no money involved. If we go out of business, you've got the copy. Like You don't have to worry about it. We're about to, um, I can't break it fully on here, but we're about to give people a pinning solution too. And it's going to make it dead simple. So like, we're just, we're here doing the unsexy infrastructure stuff to make sure that you don't get screwed the way I did the first time around when I was collecting. I mean, I had X copies first NFTs and like a bunch of other stuff that would be worth millions and like things, things, things just break, man. So like, like, why is it that everyone understands that everything else they own breaks and requires maintenance and they have to take care of it or whatever? But, like, I think I think they hear about the magical properties of the blockchain and they're like, well, it's, like, indestructible and it'll last forever. And, look, blockchain is great. Your tokens likely will be there forever or for a very, very, very long time. But your token that points to nothing isn't going to be super valuable, right? If, if you're collecting, quote, unquote, the art, the visual aspects of this, you know, no one's going to want your, your broke ass token. Uh, so, so don't get scared. Just back it up. You know, guys, I can't echo enough of, of how, how important, like what he just said is because for me, the, the former company that I, I was uh, working for, I was at a, a backup and recovery startup, a uh, data security startup for like two years. And like, as soon as I've seen like your guys' like Twitter pop up and like read like what you guys were doing, I was like, oh shit, like I need to get like, I, I hit you like, I think I hit you up. I think I hit Chris up like, hey, like when is this going to be ready? When can I use it? Um, Because I, like it clicked for me immediately. Like, oh shit, like they're like, they're right. Like, because initially when I first got in the space, I'm like, oh, okay, the art's on the chain. Like, okay. All right, and then doing more research, like, wait, 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 wait. Then everything just saw all these light bulbs just started going off to me. Like, wait, like, I, I need this service. And, and guys, just like he said, it's super easy, super intuitive process. Um, you know, you add, you, you submit a few, you know, form, uh, form fields, and then you get uh, a zip file that you can store, you know, on your computer, on your hard drive. Um, but it's, it's definitely like a super easy thing. Um, to use, but also like an invaluable tool for, for the space. Um, and, and I don't think people truly will understand how big of a deal it is. Um, probably, you know, until some years to come, you know what I mean? When people look back on, on these early days and not only again, you being an advocate for the space, how important that's been, but also providing these tools that people, you know, you're really looking out for people. And I, I, I don't think people will truly understand like how important your participation in the space was for some time. So for the future folks, again, I'd like to thank you um, just for everything you're doing. And I, I'm not blowing the smoke up your ass, man, because I think like when you when you think about life and it's like a, a finite proposition, right? We're not going to be here forever. And there's some people who are in, in it for themselves and, and don't really care about you know, the communities that, the, that they're in or, or just other people in general. Um, and when you think about the, the folks who were here that actually looked out for everybody else, you know, and made this place a better place, I can truly say that you, you, you're definitely one of those people. Um, so just know that, like, you know, for me, um, especially being in this space, just again, looking at you from afar, looking at your wife and your relationship from afar, um, the team that you guys have built, the company that you're building, um, even seeing like news articles, like with you and your team, like securing new rounds of funding and things like that. It's very inspiring for someone like myself. And uh, again, just appreciate, appreciate the time, you know, that you, you um, were able to spend with me today um, talking about your journey um, within with not only your life, but in the, the NFT space. So thanks, man. Yeah, friendships with you and opportunities like this to talk about uh, how we can build a better future really is what keeps me going and has kept me going for the, for the five years. I mean, the truth is, you know, and, and Aaron would tell you this too, I'm a bit of an introvert and would kind of, you know, quite naturally keep to myself. But it's so important to me that we build a better system to support creatives. And, uh, you know, that's what's been driving me all along. And I fell in love with the collectors and the builders and the artists and the space along the way and felt like, you know, I got so much out of it that I wanted to give something back. So it's not it's not entirely selfless. This is really giving me a way to be connected to creatives all around the world. I mean, I'm going to to Mexico in a few weeks to hang out with, um, you know, Mohara and a bunch of, who was the very first NFT artist I collected or whatever. And a lot of these people, I feel like I could go just about anywhere in the planet and like, you know, with a, an email away from a, a couch to sleep on or whatever with someone who's like crazy, smart and creative. Right. And like, 
you know, that's a long way from the, the boring ass, like hour and a half commute into sitting at a desk all day life that I lived for better part of 20 years. Right. Um, so we build it together. Uh, I love people like you that are getting the word out and like, you know, uh, appreciate the opportunity to, to come on and share my story and excited to, to follow along with the podcast. Well, guys, this has uh, been episode one of Beyond the Pixels. Again, thank you, Art Gnome, for, for joining. Tune in for uh, next week's podcast. All right. Peace.